I try to help them out, but uh, now most are good. So sorry for the delay and uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to facilitate this uh, session this afternoon on LGBTIQ plus detainees, uh, ensuring uh, safety and security and human rights for all detainees. Um, this is a participatory uh, session, so I will have a, a brief uh, introduction just to set the scenes. But the idea is to have um, a discussion with you based on, on your experience, challenges, and maybe uh, good practices that you may share that you might share, and that we will then further discuss in the in the plenary for the for the feedback. Um, if you want to uh, turn turn on your your camera, that would be great. But you don't have to. But it's always nicer for for me not to speak in front of the uh, of black screens, but thanks for those who turned it off. On, sorry. Um, so uh, my name is Jean-Sébastien Blanc. Uh, I am here speaking on behalf of none of the institutions that I work for, but just as, a, as with my independent expertise that I have gained over the years on this, on this topic. Um, but I um, have been, I was appointed recently a member of the National Committee uh, National Commission for the Prevention of Torture of Switzerland, which is the uh, national preventive mechanism uh, established under the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. And I'm also um, a research associate at the University of uh, Geneva. I worked for many years with the Association for the Prevention of Torture. And in this capacity, uh, we also uh, developed some guidance, mostly for uh, monitoring bodies to address uh, risky situations and prevent ill treatment towards uh, LGBTIQ plus detainees. So let me start by uh, sharing my screen for um, for this short um, introduction. Okay, can you can you see the screen? Yes, very good. Uh, so what I will do in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I will basically uh, provide a brief overview of uh, international, international standards and case law with regards to uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, intersex, and queer plus detainees. Then I will um, continue with briefly introducing a project that we did when I was still working at the Swiss Center of Expertise on Prison and Probation that Laura on Manda uh, introduced this morning, and that led to a set of recommendations to uh, prison authorities. And I will uh, finish by highlighting uh, the role of uh, independent um, me mechanisms and independent monitoring to places of detention to shed some lights on uh, unknown situations, I would say. So, um, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Yeah. So basically, um, we heard this. Uh, we heard earlier from uh, other panelists about how soft law is important. How we have uh, a growing set of uh, standards regarding uh, prison and human rights. But uh, unlike uh, other groups in situations of vulnerability, when it comes to LGBTIQ plus people, we have only very few standards and uh, I mean we could have a whole uh, discussions on, on why that's the case but one of the main reason I would say is the lack of consensus uh, at the international but also at the, at the regional level so that's why we have uh, very few standards but we do have some emerging uh, very interesting uh, case law uh, and I just wanted to flag a few for, for the discussion. I, I think one of the most important uh, ruling from the uh, U European Court uh, of Human Rights uh, is from two, 2012. Uh, and it's basically um, about um, a violation of uh, the prohibition of torture in conjunction with the prohibition of discrimination. In the case of a gay detainee who was placed in uh, solitary confinement, during several months uh, to protect him from uh, bullying and violence. So as we will see later in the discussion, uh, solitary confinement as a so-called protective measures 
is in fact uh, very problematic because it leads to um, to uh, psychological. Um, it can lead to psychological torture, but also to a strong feeling of uh, uh, isolation. There was also um, an interesting um, discussion. Unfortunately, there is no ruling because uh, in this case, uh, the parties uh, stroke out after reaching a friendly agreement, but uh, the court was about to um, decide on the refusal to allow a gay prisoner to have uh, conjugal visits. Um, in a case uh, that relates to Romania in 2020. So there is unfortunately no decision on that matter, but that would have been interesting to have the court uh, saying something here on discrimination. And uh, at a more general level, but I think it's very important because it does underpin uh, the whole discussion, it's the, the question of uh, gender identity. So not necessarily relating to prison, but it also applies to prison. Um, and here, uh, basically, the, co the, the court uh, ruled that uh, gender identity, including when it differs from the assigned gender, uh, is central to respect uh, human dignity and is an essential foundation of self-determination. I also wanted uh, to uh, mention some of the latest CPT reports. Uh, earlier today, uh, Triana mentioned how important uh, the CPT recommendations are beyond the specific country they, they visit. And the CPT had been very um, silent on the issue of LGBTIQ plus detainee for many years, but in the last few years, there, there is also an emerging body of uh, recommendations. And I just wanted to mention two of them, uh, one with respect to Greece and the other one to Italy, both uh, are reports from this year. And the one relating to Greece, uh, basically uh, the CPT observed that um, there was a lack of clear policy of staff training and access to purposeful activities uh, with regards to trans women who were detained in separate section of uh, women prisons. And the second one relates to Italy. And that's a very important one, I think, because the CPT uh, clearly um, said that uh, trans women should be accommodated in prison section corresponding to their gender identity, um, which uh, is not uh, a common practice across all European uh, countries. And if uh, for exceptional, uh, ex or if exceptionally uh, for security or other reason on a separate section to ensure their safety. So that's uh, that's a very important recommendation uh, from the CPT. I also wanted to mention that uh, still at the Council of Europe level, we do have, also I, I said at the beginning that there is a scarcity of standards. We do have a recommendation from the um, Council of Europe Committee of Ministers, uh, which is a general uh, recommendation on measures to combat discrimination on grounds of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity that call on states to take appropriate measures to ensure the safety and dignity of LGBT persons, uh, and in particular, to take protective measures against physical assault, rape, and other forms of sexual abuse. And that's also important to underline that it's whether committed by other inmates or by staff. And the same uh, article of this recommendation, that's the only one that relates to deprivation of liberty, uh, is that measures should be taken to um, protect and respect the gender identity of transgender individuals. Um, last but not least, um, I also wanted to uh, mention the so-called Jakarta principle uh, plus 10. So those um, are a body of principles that have been adopted in 2006 by, by a, a group of um, well-renowned uh, experts on uh, the application of human rights, international human rights law to uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and sexual characteristics. And they have been revised in 2017. And so they cover the whole spectrum of, um, of human rights, but they have three, there are three um, principles uh, that are relevant to the topic we are discussing today. One is the rights uh, to freedom for, from arbitrary uh, detention. 
One is the right to a treatment, a human treatment in detention, and the last one is the right to be freed from torture and other treatment. It's important to stress that they are not a binding document. They are not even considered soft law. Also, we heard uh, later today that soft law is not a well-defined uh, legal concept. But I think what we should um, uh, stress is that they have been increasingly cited in case law, in official reports, including uh, by the CPT, by the European Court for, of Human Rights. So uh, they do have a very strong uh, authoritative uh, status. Now, I said that I would uh, present as an example um, a project uh, which, in a way, is a way to show how prison authorities can adopt a non-discriminatory approach. Um, and so that was at the time when I was working with the Swiss Center of Expertise in Prison and Probation. And um, so the Swiss uh, Center has also the mandate to improve the quality of the execution of sanctions. And in that framework, um, we basically worked on a so-called framework document on the handling and care of LGBTIQ plus detainees that included uh, 16 uh, recommendations. I'm not going to go through the recommendations now, but it's basically uh, framed under the framework of um, human dignity and the right to uh, self-determination when it comes to gender identity. What I wanted to, to underline regarding this, uh, this project is uh, basically two main elements. One is that um, I do think that in uh, such initiatives, it's important to, um, to adopt a participatory approach, which means that um, the process itself should include uh, LGBTIQ plus experts and a specialized NGO. And there is um, a so-called uh, nothing about us without us principle that I think should be at the center of any such initiatives. And the second aspect, uh, I think, is uh, it's important also to to uh, work in close uh, cooperation with uh, prison authorities and basically to uh, consult uh, prison authorities on the feasibility of the application of the recommendation. So what we did is that prior to the adoption of the recommendation, we did a consultation with the 26 um, state within the states of Switzerland to uh, ensure the buy-in from um, different prison authorities. Um, the, um, the document is available on the link you can see on the, on the screen. Uh, the recommendations also include uh, the importance to uh, raise, awareness, raise awareness and train uh, prison staff. And actually, at the moment of uh, initiating the project, the curriculum of the prison staff was amended um, in order to ensure that a uh, mandatory uh, module on the handling and care of LGBTIQ detainees would be delivered to uh, the prison uh, officers. Um, the last point I wanted to mention uh, before entering into the discussion is the role of independent monitoring bodies, and in particular, but not exclusively, the role of national preventive mechanisms. Um, I think as uh, given the, the very uh, broad mandate they have and the uh, ability to access all places of deprivation of liberty and all documentations, and also all persons who are deprived of liberty, they are in a unique position to actually gather evidence and provide data on the situation of, um, in this case, LGBTIQ plus detainees, but obviously not exclusively. Uh, so in that capacity, I do think they, they can play a role and actually they are playing a role. Um, there are more and more uh, thematic reports being published by NPMs uh, across the world on, um, on the situation of LGBTIQ plus detainees. With just uh, the example of Brazil uh, issuing a thematic reports uh, with the support of NGOs uh, a couple of weeks ago. The special reporter on uh, torture, uh, 
from the United Nations, uh, published a very important report in 2016 on gender and torture. And um, one of the recommendations is basically to adopt for all stakeholders what he called at the time vulnerability lens. Um, and in, in that regard, I think uh, monitoring bodies, but it could also apply to other entities uh, when they decide to start monitoring a specific situation, should also revise their uh, instruments and tools, and also consult and, uh, and include um, NGOs uh, that are specialized in this topic. Very importantly, in the same report, the special reporter uh, also state, stated that the inclusion of LGBT persons and other minority um, representation on inspection bodies help facilitate the reporting of gender-based violence and discrimination and identity and identify cases of torture. So I think that's very much um, in line with the um, with the, the provision within the optional protocol that uh, this uh, national preventive mechanisms should have a very diverse compositions, not only in terms of uh, professional background, but also in terms of uh, identity. And the, the guide that I mentioned earlier, so it's a practical guide on monitoring the situation of LGBTIQ plus uh, detainees is also available on the uh, Association for the Prevention of Tortures website. Uh, you can see the link on the screen. So um, for, for the discussion, I think um, I thought that instead of having uh, too many questions, uh, I just wanted to open um, the discussions with basically two uh, main questions um, that are closely uh, related. One is the, the challenges that you have faced uh, with regards to. Th then the questions depend on your on your own uh, uh, professional uh, current position as a as a prison uh, administration, as a monitoring body, as a researcher. But basically, what challenges you have faced. But also, if there are any good practices that you could um, that you could share, and I will stop uh, uh, sharing my screen, and uh, with this, I suggest um, that we open the floor for the contributions, remarks, comments. So, if anything wasn't clear in my uh, presentation, please feel free to also. Uh, it was very short because I had to um, summarize it, but hopefully some of the the important elements uh, relating to the challenges. Um, yeah. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Jean Sebastian. Um, you had the two main questions at the end, uh, challenges that you're facing in maybe your own countries or services even and good practices to share right those were the two Absolutely. yeah yeah okay so let's leave the floor open for interventions or questions anyone wants to start and please uh, keep your um, camera on that uh, creates a nicer more interactive environment Scott McClellan, please. Yeah, uh, my name is Scott McClellan from the Scottish Prison Service. Uh, we've been uh, um, embroiled in a really difficult and challenging situation with transgender prisoners. Uh, predominantly, it became a very political issue with housing male trans people in female establishments with a sexual crime. So it start, the, the scenario started when uh, an individual changed his gender just before he went to court and was then found guilty of rape and then was, a, then was located in a female prison. And it became, which was, the, which was in line with our policy, uh, to allow the person to self uh, come out what, what gender he was. 
And that became very, very political and and, and it's still uh, rumbling. In fact, we've had to freeze a policy, rewrite a policy, uh, and it basically led to our First Minister's resignation uh, because there was a, a really difficult time about asking, repeatedly asking, is it a man or a woman? Uh, and, and kind of willing to admit rape then was the following answer. So it was it was a really really difficult time uh, that moved away from the, the trans issue and into the uh, wider debate about what society thinks a, a male and female can do in, in relation to crime. Uh, so we've been really stuck in in a a difficult and challenging six months period. We're not through that period yet. We're rewriting our policy. But we've basically reviewed every single trans person we've got. In, we've got 23 in custody just now. Uh, I, I wouldn't say we have good practice, but I think it's something that potentially uh, others might learn from. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Scott. Um, actually, uh, the Scottish case had uh, massive repercussions uh, beyond the Scottish borders, uh, including in, in Switzerland, there were lots of uh, media articles that uh, completely misread uh, what had happened in Scotland, because to my knowledge, uh, the specific case you are referring to uh, related to a trans women who had not been uh, who had not uh, undergone surgery and who was um, detained in a women facility uh, pending trial and uh, and also uh, I also read about the case and the case showed that this person was not um, in at any moment uh, in direct contact with uh, fellow inmates, and she stayed in that prison only for 24, 48 hours. So I think in that case, what's interesting is to see how the media, and when I say the media, I refer to some sometimes some specific media, tend to uh, direct the discussions uh, in a completely uh, different direction, where actually, uh, and mostly, I would say, from uh, right-wing uh, media uh, to um, basically undermine uh, the work of uh, prison services that have been working on that topic very diligently for many years uh, and also drafting very subtle policies because, to my knowledge, the Scottish policy does not say that this transfer should be done on an automatic basis, but that uh, several uh, criteria should be uh, taken into, into consideration, but I think it's a crucial point that you raise because um, as, as this uh, discussion takes place in, uh, in the framework of, of human rights and dignity in prison, I think we should go back to that. And if uh, different uh, countries have started um, uh, drafting policies on transgender uh, detainees, it's mostly because in the first place, uh, that's the population that was the most exposed to to violence. So that's um, it's not doing justice to the to the real situation, and it's not even yeah. evidence based. Absolutely. Mm. Maybe I don't know if in other contexts uh, similar uh, challenges have have been um, have emerged. Or if in, in your own countries you also had some repercussion from the from the Scottish uh, case. I see Dana is Dana Sau Sauka. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, feel free to unmute. <laughs> All right, thanks. Well, um, I'm a prison officer in Spain, so. I'm going to ask something related to that, uh, but with more of a practical approach to help us out, prison officers, with this um, big topic that we are dealing with. Um, I've had a case similar to what well, quite a challenging case in a um, maximum security prison, and it's quite usual 
uh, with trans prisoners that they feel that they don't fit in any um, in either a female wing or a male wing. So they try to change the wing. So it's something that we um, kind of allow to try to help them out to to feel free and to find their place in um, in such a hostile environment. But then reality is that it entails many problems in practice. Cause not because they are trans, of course. So um, don't get me wrong in this, but because we are in prison, so they tend to trade everything they ha they have. You know, not only cigarettes, but everything they have in their power, pills, everything. So in the in this case, sometimes they can trade with their bodies. You know, when they are um, deprived of contact with um, people of the opposite sex, you know, there are some needs and, you know. So my question is, um, what could we do to um, amend the situation to try to find balance? I mean, because of course we can't constantly allow that change, but we, we need to do something to, to help them but to also preserve the security of of the the prison. Um, thank you very much. No, no, thank you very much for raising this this example. And uh, before I I reply, just let me stress that there is no um, at this stage uh, a very clear guidance that would apply uh, to all contexts. I think we need to take into consideration every specific uh, context, including the cultural context within this framework of human rights. In the, in the Swiss context, uh, in this um, policy document that I mentioned with the recommendation, I would say that the main recommendations is to um, respect the principle of self-determination at the moment of uh, placement in a, in a male or female facility, a wing of, within a, a larger prison. And, um, so what we have observed in, in Switzerland, but we have a broad diversity of practice is that, uh, and we have highlighted this as a, as a good practice in this framework document, is uh, to um, allocate a trans women, so a person who was born a man uh, at birth and transition uh, and, and is now a trans woman, um, to allocate this person in um, female facility, uh, and that would, uh, to some extent, because we cannot rule out that there will be uh, other problems in the female facility, but uh, in general terms, that would uh, guarantee uh, her safety, uh, while also preserving the safety of the other detainees. So there are some accommodations that are made in these uh, prisons. Uh, for instance, if the woman has not undergone surgery, so that, that she would have an individual cell and that we, she would go to uh, the showers uh, on her own. But at least there is no uh, isolation as there would be in other prisons because she can participate in activities and work with fellow inmates. Um, but when, uh, in, in my experience, in, in what I could observe, when they are placed in uh, male facilities, uh, it's precisely what you said. So to avoid sexual exploitation, sex trade, and etc., uh, what they do is that they would place them often in solitary confinement. Uh, and we know that solitary confinement is never a good idea uh, as a long-term solution. So my my shorter re reply to you would be to really try to ensure that we. Uh, respect this principle of self-determination and that we take uh, allocations decision on that basis. Although I know that it's it's never as easy as it might say when we say it. Scott, do you have a want to reply on that? Yeah. I... So I, I used to be a prison governor and, and, and a prison full of sex offenders, and and that type of behaviour 
that was described as common in, in, in that kind of population. And I think what we did, we would do is involve the person in a multidisciplinary conversation about their behaviours and their conduct. Because there's, there's a number of things there. There's a public health issue. There's, uh, so there's a health issue. There's a risk to the person. You, you, would, you would try to get them involved in a conversation about what the standards of behaviour you'd expect. You'd also try to use your rules or regulations. So, in some instances, we ha we have a, a a rule called Rule ninety five that you can take people out of association. But you've got a lesser rule, which is a prescribed activity. So you can lead the person in full association and prescribed activities that they're not allowed to do, so like going to the showers. Uh, with with large groups of people going into other people's cells, so you would you would start to define it. You would also keep a a, 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 a kind of a very close one to one relationship with a person officer or somebody to try and encourage that individual, and you'd have regular contact. And for me, that's that's it's not really a trans issue. It's more just the people's behaviours. People have been having sex with each other, whatever prison, for long and weary. Yeah, thank you. If I can just react on that, I think uh, um, the what you said about the multidisciplinary approach and uh, and having some sort also of uh, of board or committee that would uh, assess from multiple perspective the the situation is very very important. And we we studied a specific case in in Switzerland uh, regarding not a trans woman but a trans man who was. Um, allocated uh, in the male prison, but in the female section, there was a very short, very small female section for pretrial detainees. And uh, what I found very interesting in that specific situation that was very complicated to handle is that uh, from the outset, uh, there was a joint initiative from both the direction and the medical services to actually accompany this person in the, in the decision-making process. And not only did they do that, but they also um, had um, a conversation of several conversation with the other female detainees in the prison to ensure that nothing would appear as being imposed upon them. So I think it's, and it, and it worked in the end quite well. So I think it, it does imply that there is more extra resources that are invested in, in a case, but uh, in the end, uh, it enables uh, both the, the, the fact that we can guarantee the, the human rights and the dignity of the person, but also the, the safety and the security of the, of the prison. I guess we have time for one, maybe one more uh, comment. Fiona? Thanks. Um, just to say that well, this summer we tried to do some research, um, like a sort of global scan to see what are the national policies around allocation or placement of trans people in prison. Um, like where are their written policies um, and where there are, what do they say? Um, and so we have the sort of raw data now collected from that. Um, and we'll be moving to the next stage shortly around um, sort of uh, yeah, analysis um, and hopefully putting together a briefing, um, if not the end of this year, early next year. Um, so we're working together with TGEU on that, Transgender Europe, um, and possibly GATE as well. Um, and yeah, I think from what we've seen so far, at least without doing any proper analysis yet, um, it's so varied. And of course, it's it's an area where a lot of places won't, a lot of countries won't have a national policy, but there have to be practice that, you know, things have to happen in, in practical terms. So um, it's interesting to see how differently things develop going back to your point Jean-Sebastien about the the cultural context 
you know, that there are quite different approaches in different places. Um, and I know we heard from, well, in some places there are, say, designated wings where there may be, for example, gay men and trans women together. Um, and then there are, so in terms of the personal experience on a day to day, it may be preferable for someone to, depending on their individual choice, kind of be separated, but together in that sense, you know, so you're not in solitary or a total isolation, but in maybe what's seen as a safer context. Um, but then there are so many exceptions, you know, to everything. And it's so much down to the individual choice. Um, so other people can be really unhappy in that. And we heard from a representative of the Thai corrections um, at the a UN meeting in May, where they had put in this policy where there'd be a separate wing um, for LGBT, LGBTQ uh, detainees and they did that for a trial period and they decided you know it was all in consultation and there was a process around it and they decided that they didn't want that they wanted to be with the the population and um, so yeah it's just as you said I think around the kind of particip participation in in decision making being really important as well so I'll share whatever outcomes we find with you in due course yeah, thanks, Trion. I had no idea PRI was uh, developing this uh, this compilation, and I think it will be most helpful because we still lack uh, data. Uh, there are many recommendations, including from the Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture, to collect more data on the. So they would like to have first first hand information from detainees, but that's obviously uh, for many reasons difficult to get. But at least if we have some sort of overview of uh, what are the policies, what are the trends uh, at the international level, I think that would be most helpful. Is this something I can mention in the wrap up at the at the end or it's still? Uh... Yeah, certainly you can. And I'll email you separately. Maybe we can chat next week or, or soon about it. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to hear about the project. And yeah, regarding the cultural dimension, um, I was in uh, in Peru a few, a few days ago uh, for training with the National Preventive Mechanism. And uh, so they published a thematic report on the topic. And uh, what's interesting in the, in the region, not in Peru in particular, but in many countries of Latin America, is that um, most large prisons have a separate unit, uh, not for LGBTIQ plus detainees, but main, mostly for trans women and gay uh, men. Um, and that's part of the culture uh, that raises lots of questions in terms of uh, segregation and uh, isolation and uh, not necessarily ensuring that uh, there are fewer risks. But if you talk to the detainees, most of the detainees actually uh, prefer this situation as opposed to being uh, with the rest of the prison population. So I think it, we cannot have um, a we need tailor-made approach for the, dependent on the, on the context dependent on the on the problems we we have in in the different prisons some of them are more violent than others and i think we need to take that also into uh, into account um, i think we i don't know if anyone else wants to uh, Gustav, i think we will be automatically uh, called to the to the main room um let me unmute i had to check with my colleagues how they were doing in their other rooms but we will finish now in a couple of minutes uh thank you very much jean sebastian and uh, uh the rest of the participants it was very uh, important and interesting discussion and uh, jean sebastian I, I hope you can let's say summarize a little bit of what's been mentioned in this um uh, breakout just uh, before we wrap up in the plenary. Um, uh, I think the the transgender um, say um, I wouldn't call it an issue, but because it's 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 been it's been a fact for many years, but but somehow it's been politicized very much now, and it creates a completely different dynamic for also for prison services. So. Uh, we need to uh, keep discussing this and how to sort of meet the needs of these prisoners and also, as you say, 
maintaining safety uh, for mm -hmm. for for all uh, in the prison. So um, thank you for your participation in this breakout session, and uh, I'll see you soon in the in the plenary hall. Thank you very much, everyone.